Hello everyone, and today we're going to go over Hunter Arendt's book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, Chapter 9, entitled The Decline of the Nation State and the End of the Rights of Man. Arendt starts the chapter by talking about the aftermath of World War I. She says it's like no other war because it affects the whole European comedy of nations. According to Arendt, it exploded, leading to an increase in unemployment, inflation, eventually multiple civil wars that happened between the two world war periods. These civil wars created refugees on a massive scale, which led to statelessness and eventually the decline of the rights of man. Speaking of the refugees, she quotes, Once they had left their homeland, they remained homeless. Once they had left their state, they became stateless. Once they had been deprived of their human rights, they became rightless, the scum of the earth. According to Rent, after World War I, this explosion led to basically a state of skepticism and anger, where everything was hated. This hatred shattered the facade of European political organizations. And this hatred that played a central role in political affairs was most prevalent in the defeated countries of World War I, including uh, the dual monarchy of Austria and Tsarist Russia. Now, before the war, these countries were led by a central bureaucracy that acted as the medium between multiple different nationalities. However, after, war, after the war, this bureaucracy was, uh, was removed, and thus it became a many-to-many kind of fight between the nationalities of the people and the country. According to Arendt, what were seen as petty nationalistic quarrels were something much more, and something much more which produced a group of two different types of people, one minorities and two stateless people. While minority groups emerged in the belt of mixed populations, which is mostly in southern and eastern Europe, uh, stateless people emerged uh, in the western and central parts of the continent. What made these groups special is that they lost their rights. They lost the right of man which the French Revolution had fought for back in the 18th century. They were no longer seen as part of the citizenship and the body of the politic. They had no governments to represent them. They lived outside the pale of law. And since they lived outside the pale of law, they were also persecuted outside the pale of law. The rights of man, which previously established man as having inalienable rights, was backed of the authority that was given by the nature of man. However, this authority lacked any legitimacy at this time. Instead, the authority became the nation itself, and the people who deserved rights were the people who did good for the nation and people who didn't seem to contribute to the nation were seen, quote unquote, as the scum of the people. Quote, the official SS newspaper, the Schwartz Corpse, stated explicitly in 1938 that if the world was not yet convinced that the Jews were the scum of the earth, it soon would be when identifiable beggars without nationality, without money, and without passports crossed their frontiers. But to truly understand the effects of the stateless and the minority people, we have to look at it in the context of the disintegration of the nation states at this time. According to Arendt, the disintegration of the nation states started after World War I. It was led mostly by an increase in uh, the refugee movement and also uh, the rise of minorities via the peace treaties of World War I. The framers of the peace treaties of World War I tried to reconstitute nation states. However, according to Arendt, a nation state requires two things. First, it requires a homogeneity of population, and it also requires rootedness in the soil. Both were lacking in this belt of mixed populations where they tried to establish nation states. While nation states were established after World War I, it led to a divide of people, namely into three categories. First, the states people, and these, the peace treaties basically uh, gave legitimacy to the states people as controlling the government of the newly founded nation. Then you had the citizens, who were part of the nation and who were seen as uh, being under the uh, eyes of the government. And finally, you had the minorities, who were not seen as uh, citizens of the nation, but instead were protected by a whole exceptional uh, case of law 
which was uh, given authority through international uh, groups like the League of Nations. Quote, the result was that those people to whom the states were not conceded considered the treaties an arbitrary game which handed out rule to some and servitude to others. According to Arendt, the whole nation-state system failed mostly because it didn't give at least 25% of the population the ability to contribute to the building of the common good. And even after the peace treaties of World War I, 30% of the population existed outside as an exceptional case. Even more so, the minority treaties that were established on the peace treaties of World War I didn't constitute all minorities. It only constituted the, the, the majority of minorities that lived at a certain number of people in a certain number of nations. The worst aspect of the situation, according to Arendt, is that the minorities didn't feel like they were emancipated at all. And in order to be emancipated, they needed to constitute their own national country. This idea eventually resulted in a tension between the countries that they lived in that were governed by a certain nation and the minorities. The minorities wanted to basically have their own country, but they were put into another country which they didn't belong and they didn't want to belong either. The voice of the minorities was supposed to be had through the League of Nations or other international organizations, but the League of Nations also seemed to be a failure in trying to reveal uh, this voice. Quote, the League, after all, was composed of national statesmen whose sympathies could not but be with the unhappy new governments, which were hampered and opposed on principle by between 25 and 50 percent of their inhabitants. The minority treaties were thus interpreted not to protect the minorities, but as a tool to assimilate those minorities into the majority nationality of their country. Quote, the object of the minority treaties is to secure that measure of protection and justice which would gradually prepare them to be merged in the national community to which they belonged. Even more so, the minority treaties were only seen as a temporary solution until the minorities were assimilated. But according to Arendt, these attempts at assimilation failed. The minorities didn't want to be assimilated into a culture and nationality to whom they saw as an inferior culture. They wanted to keep their own traditions, their own culture, because they, that's what defined them. That was part of their identity. Soon fed up with both the attempts of the League of Nations and the countries to assimilate the minorities, the minorities created their own international group. This group was called the Congress of Organized National Groups in European States. This new group was supposed to represent the minorities and not try to push them into assimilation. However, this group had its faults too. According to Arendt, it was dominated mostly by Germans and Jews. And what was supposed to represent a common interest amongst all minorities turned into a group that favored the majority of the minorities within the group. Also, this group didn't survive unless the Germans got along with the Jews, because those were the two um, most present minorities in the group. However, this failed when uh, the Jews demanded that the Germans treat the Jewish population in the Third Reich uh, with more uh, respect, and the Germans denied this. Now, minorities have existed in the past, so what makes it different now we're, that we're talking about it now? Well, the minority treaties after World War I introduced minorities as an institution. They officially recognized millions of inhabitants in Europe to be an exception of the law of the nations that they resided. Quote, the minority treaties said in plain language what until then had been only implied in the wording system of nation states, namely that only nationals could be citizens that persons of different nationality needed some law of exception until or unless they were completely assimilated and divorced from their origin. This insisted that the law of the country was only responsible for people who identified with a nation. Di Mello Franco uh, of the representation of Brazil in the Council of the League of Nations is quoted saying, it seems to me obvious that those who conceived this world of protection did not dream of creating within certain states a group of inhabitants who would regard themselves as permanently foreign to the general organization of the country. And thus the countries only felt responsible for the people who identified as part of the nation. And in this sense, the transformation of the nation state into a nation occurred. The state was 
uh, subjugated into becoming only a tool to recognize the ideals of the nation. This would go so far to say uh, that Hitler eventually quoted that what is right for the nation is what is right for the German people. Everything that acted against the national will of the nation was seen as an obstacle that needed to be overcome. While minorities were most prevalent in uh, the eastern and southern parts of Europe, where there was no constitutional government that protected the inalienable rights of the people, the western and the central uh, European nations, who were built on this way, uh, saw not minorities, but an emergence of a people that Arendt calls stateless. These older nations were, again, built on the rights of man, which can see its origins in the French Revolution. According to Arendt, statelessness is the newest mass phenomenon of contemporary history. Statelessness occurs when a citizen becomes denaturalized where the government doesn't see them as a citizen, but the citizen still lives within the territory of the country. Denaturalization became most prominent after World War I. Uh, it became a tool for countries to remove people of the, within the nation who didn't recognize themselves as part of the nation. However, right after World War I, it was still very few a number that denaturalizations were used. It was only until the 30s uh, when mass denaturalizations happened, mostly with the cancellation of certain promises for naturalization of refugees. Governments attempted to deport the stateless people back to their national countries of origin. However, many of these stateless people didn't recognize a certain home to which they belonged. In fact, a pattern emerged where uh, refugees were deported by one country to another country, and then another country to another country, and they really failed to find a home because they kept on getting deported. It was only until they recognized themselves as a stateless people that the country could no longer deport them. In a sense, they became undeportable. The solution to deport and denaturalize citizens was a new phenomenon. The countries no longer wanted citizens who would act against the will of the country. They rather get rid of them than have to deal with them. Quote, one is almost tempted to measure the degree of totalitarian infection by the extent to which the conserved governments use their sovereign right of denationalization. Why is this totalitarian? Well, I think Arendt would say that it's totalitarian because totalitarianism is characterized as a movement towards an ideology by decree. Anything that gets in the way of this movement or this ideology is seen as a barrier that needs to be overcome. And if citizens are this, then they need to get rid of them in some measure. According to Arendt, however, there exists a contradiction. The contradiction is that these countries were built on the idea of inalienable rights of man, where just by being man, just by being a human, you have certain rights. But this was anything but the case for these stateless people. In the 30s, this issue of statelessness grew and grew and grew. And as it grew, the response and reaction to denaturalization increased as well. Radical new decrees were put in place. The Nazis in 1943 deported 5,000 Jews, quote, insisted that all Jews of non-German nationality should be deprived of their citizenship either prior to or at the latest of on the day of deportation. So there's many, many stateless people in these nation states. How did it affect the nation state itself? Well, for one, the only really lawful way to uh, protect citizens of different countries was asylum. However, there were so many stateless people, there were so many refugees that asylum, that tool, could not uh, meet the capacity of the populations. But second, and I think more importantly, was that these refugees who were stateless within these countries, uh, there was a realization that they did not want to belong to the nation, even though the efforts of assimilation, they didn't work. The two methods of assimilation, according to Arendt, were repatriation and naturalization. Repatriation is deporting the people back to the country of their home, 
However, again, repatriation couldn't work with people who didn't specify or didn't uh, belong to any one country within Europe. Because these people existed outside the pill of law, they were again also dealt with outside the pill of law. Quote, the state was forced by the legal nature of statelessness into admittedly illegal acts. It smuggled its expelled stateless into the neighboring countries, with the result that the latter retaliated in kind. The consequences of the smuggling of refugees across borders was like a fight between uh, police forces in different nations trying to push as many refugees into the, the opposing nation. This became such an issue that international conferences were held with the main central uh, question being posed as how do we make the refugee deportable again. Arendt quotes Childs saying uh, that the real difficulty about receiving a refugee is that he turns out badly. There is no way of getting rid of him. The other way of assimilation again was naturalization and as we said before this failed because um, the refugees saw didn't want to give up their culture, didn't want to give up their nationality to the home nationality of the country that they were currently dwelling. In addition, there were many cancellations of naturalizations that occurred and that gave little confidence for the refugees in the system of naturalization. The refugees were also not very keen on becoming naturalized citizens because the naturalized citizens were not treated very much better than the stateless people anyway. According to Rent, once statelessness started within a nation, it became somewhat of a pandemic. Governments felt helpless in trying to deal with the situation. Once the government tried to deport uh, these refugees, these refugees assumed uh, statelessness and became again outside the pale of law and the political body. And these people who lived outside the pale of law also damaged the National Institute. This, these stateless people were not given rights to uh, have a home. They were not given rights to have a job. They were really just kind of living in a nation but not contributing to it in any productive way. And they weren't illegally able to contribute in any productive way either. Thus, if a stateless person was trying to contribute to the country, they would be seen as a, uh, someone who should be sent to jail immediately because they didn't have the rights to. Quote, the best criterion by which to decide whether someone has been forced outside the pale of law is to ask if he would benefit by committing a crime. If a small burglary is likely to improve his legal position, at least temporarily, one may be sure he has been deprived of human rights. Now this quote is so crucial. The idea that being outside the pale of law, being not, not seen in the government as a citizen was worse off than any criminal acts that you could do because once you commit a criminal act, you're seen at least with, uh, within an equal body of citizens who must abide by those rules. It's only until you're outside that system that any illegal act can be forced upon you. Only as an offender of the law can you gain protection from it. Quote, as long as his trial and his sentence last, he will be safe from that arbitrary police rule against which there are no lawyers and no appeals. The point is that the government transferred responsibility of dealing with these stateless people, not in the courts, but through police action, through decrees. The police were no longer a tool for executing the law that was written down, but they were given authority to deal with the stateless people as they do. And the power of the police force grew in correlation to the issue of statelessness. It grew so much that it became even somewhat of a international institution where police forces in different countries would work together to deal with this stateless issue. According to Rent, if a Nazi puts someone in a concentration camp and they escaped uh, to, say, uh, Holland, then the police force there would then put them into an internment camp. Quote, that the Nazis eventually met with so disgracefully little resistance from the police in the countries they occupied was due at least in part to the powerful position which the police had achieved over the years and their unrestricted and arbitrary domination of stateless and refugees. According to Arendt, the Jews were a particular focus 
as a minority. They were the minority par excellence because they were seen as minorities in so many countries around Europe that they became basically the figurehead of the minority. For this reason, the Germans targeted the Jews first in their war against statelessness. Quote, the nation that statelessness is primarily a Jewish problem was a pretext used by all governments who tried to settle the problem by ignoring it. Hitler's solution was to drive the Jewish people uh, into a non-recognized minority and then drive them as stateless people across its borders and then eventually using the police to gather them up and ship them into extermination camps. He deprived them of their rights, of the rights of man, again, that were instituted in the French Revolution, that were seen supposed to be as inalienable rights. But how did we lose the rights of man? How did we lose the inalienable rights that you are a person, thus you are given rights that everyone is granted? According to Arendt, this idea of inalienable rights as having rights just because you are a human was based on an authority that was given by the nature of man, something that is natural. This is different to authorities in the past before the French Revolution where authority gave rights of man based off of either religious, political, or spiritual mediums. Since the rights during the French Revolution and the rights of man were given by an authority of nature, it was really no single political body or group organization that endowed rights. It was simply given by natural causes. Quote, the people's sovereignty was not proclaimed by the grace of God, but in the name of man, so that it seemed only natural that the inalienable rights of man would find their guarantee and become an inalienable part of the right of the people to sovereign self-government. But again, a paradox exists in this idea of inalienable rights because at this time, the European people looked at tribal nations in Africa and despite that they were seen as man, they did not afford them this rights of man or inalienable rights. The people and the tribal people of Africa were seen as exception cases, as outside of civilization, where in Europe you built a civilization you built certain human artifice that created a created a nation, created a country. Whereas in Africa, the Europeans perceived the tribal people as simply subsisting off the land. Thus, the idea of inalienable rights was smuggled in with the idea of nationality, that you did not really get rights unless you were a part of a people, a people being that of a European civilized nation. Thus, quote, the whole question of human rights therefore was quickly and inextricably blended with the question of national emancipation. Only the emancipated sovereignty of the people seemed to be able to ensure them. Thus, for the stateless people and the minorities who were not uh, represented by any single government, they were also deprived of their human rights. According to Arendt, efforts to uh, declare an international rights of man share the vocabulary as if protecting an endangered species. That originally the rights of man was seen as something to be proud of, that everyone shared in, the rights of man became a way to uh, give charity to those people who were not a part of any single nation. According to Arendt, the first thing that these minorities and stateless people suffered was the deprivation of their home. And the critical aspect here is that it's not about losing a home as much as it is about not being able to find a new one. The second loss of these people was the loss of governmental protection. This didn't imply a loss of legal status in one country, but in all countries combined. Quote, the new refugees were persecuted not because of what they had done or thought, but because of what they were unchangeably were born into the wrong kind of race or the wrong kind of class or drafted by the gov wrong kind of government. This deprivation of rights was an entirely new phenomenon according to Arendt. Quote, the soldier during the war is deprived of the right to life, the criminal of his right to freedom, all citizens during an emergency of their right to the pursuit of happiness, but nobody would ever claim that in any of these instances a loss of human rights has taken place.
It's not any single right that is being deprived of people, but the right to have rights in the first place. Quote, their plight is not that they are not equal before the law, but that no law exists for them. Not that they are oppressed by that nobody wants even to oppress them. In effect, they became superfluous in context to the governments that were in control of the nations that they resided. No government wanted to maintain responsibility of these people, thus they treated them as not people at all. And this is the crucial point here, according to Arendt, quote, the fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested first and above all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinion significant and actions effective. If we do not listen to someone's opinion, if we do not take their actions into consequence, then these people, according to Arendt, are deprived of their humanhood. And it's here that we see Anna Arendt's famous uh, idea of the right to have right. If you are not treated as a human, if you don't have your actions seen, if you don't have your speech heard, then you are, in essence, having your rights deprived of having rights at all. Again, the rightless are not deprived of any single freedom, but again, the right to have the option to have freedom in the first place. What we thought of human right that we see today might have been thought in the 18th century as something that was given uh, at the outset by nature itself, by simply being a human, you should be afforded these rights. But according to Arendt, this nature, this authority which granted rights onto people, was alienated. Uh, alienated mostly actually through uh, man's obsession with technology and dominating nature itself. For nature lost its authority once man was able to control it, thus man as being granted rights through the authority of nature no longer held. Thus, if nature loses its authority, then what is the authority that gives rights to humans? According to Rent, in the 20th century, the thing that replaced this authority was the nation, that you are granted rights if you are seen as a part of the nation. Quote, a conception of law which identifies what is right with the nation of what is good for becomes inevitable once the absolute and transcendent measurements of religion or the law of nature have lost their authority. According to Arendt, this argument aligns very much with Edmund Burke's idea of entailed inheritance. Now, Edmund Burke didn't live in this time, he lived in the 18th century, he was an English statesman and philosopher. Edmund Burke actually rejected the idea of inalienable rights during the French Revolution. He rejected the idea of an inalienable rights because it also maintained the idea of the rights of, he quoted, the, the naked savage. Thus, Edmund Burke kind of uh, predicted the idea of citizens, or sorry, not citizens, but people in nations who did not contribute to the building of the nation itself. He thought that those who lived outside of the nation within the nation would eventually erode the nation and the excellence of the nation back into savagery. For Burke, neither natural law or the rights of man bestow rights onto a person. Instead, what bestows rights is the nation. And uh, the entailed inheritance through generations back and rootedness in the nation. That being merely a human, a naked human, does not afford you the rights that are granted by those who live in a nation. And Arendt agrees with this to a certain extent. In a political society, we come together in a public sphere to uh, speak and act towards a single common good or human artifice. Those who do not partake in this activity are also not heard and do not have any action of what is becoming. Quote, the more highly developed the civilization, the more accomplished the world it has produced, the more at home men feel within the human artifice, the more they will resent everything they have not produced, everything that is merely and mysteriously given them. Arendt continues with this idea with the distinction between the private and the public sphere. In the private sphere, there is this givenness that we must react to the biological necessities like eating, like reproducing, like managing the household. In the public sphere, however, everyone comes on equal ground to discuss politics and political life and what is right and what is wrong. Those who do not participate in the public sphere are not seen as equal 
uh, in the first place. Quote, we are not born equal, we become equal as members of a group on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. Thus, equality is not granted through just being a person in itself, but being a part of a community that discusses what is right and what is wrong. It is only when we don't see each other as equal that we start to deprive people of their rights. Quote, if a Negro in a white community is considered a Negro and nothing else, he loses along with his right to equality that freedom of action, which is specifically human. All his deeds are now explained as necessary consequences of some Negro qualities. And just like the Negro and the whites, Arendt extrapolates this to the stateless and the minorities during the time before World War II. To be afforded rights means to be able to participate and act within a public sphere. And there is a growing hatred of anybody who does not participate in this public sphere, but reaps the benefit of it. This increasing number of stateless people are seen as a threat to political life itself. Quote, the danger is that a global, globally, universally interrelated civilization may produce barbarians from its own mists by forcing millions of people into conditions which, despite appearances, are the conditions of savages. That's chapter nine. I hope you enjoyed it. I've been not reading as much Hannah Arendt recently, but hopefully I can get through the rest of this book. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down in the comment section. Thank you.